الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على عبد الله ورسوله نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وجعل ما نتعلمه حجة لنا لا علينا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين أما بعد So I believe we have reached hadith number 107 hadith number 107 which is the hadith of Aisha radiyallahu anha wa an Aisha radiyallahu anha annaha qalat kana rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yagtasilu min arba' min aljanabati wa yawm aljumu'ati wa min alhijamati wa min ghasl almayyit Rawahu Abu Dawood wa sahahahu Ibn Khuzaymah We have this hadith of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to make ghusl for four things for four reasons or because of four things the first one is al-janaba we spoke about al-janaba in our previous lesson and we said that al janaba is by consensus of the scholars required to make ghusl from the second one is yawmul jumu'ah the day of jumu'ah and this is also by consensus of the scholars by agreement of the scholars that there is a ghusl on yawmul jumu'ah our next two hadith will deal with whether this ghusl is obligatory or whether this ghusl is optional or mustahab or recommended. But there is no disagreement among the scholars that there is a ghusl on the day of Jumu'ah. There is no disagreement that there is a ghusl on the day of Jumu'ah. Then we come to the last two and this is where there is a little bit of, uh, a little bit of uh, controversy. So the first one is Al-Hijama. And I'm not sure if we've spoken about what hijama is, but we should just uh, speak about it again, just so everyone is clear. That hijama is a medical treatment. It is a treatment which is both medical and it is also sunnah, because it is part of the treatment that the Prophet ﷺ recommended and used. Uh, such as the statement of the Prophet ﷺ, in kana shifa'u fa fi if there is going to be a cure, then it will be in one of three things. And one of them he mentioned is the blade of the hajjam, the blade of the person who performs hijama. So hijama is a, uh, a medical procedure which takes place. And it involves placing a cup or a horn into various, onto various parts of the skin and applying either pressure or heat or both. And basically at making the blood sort of congeal into one place and gather in one place uh, and then removing that cup or that horn and making small incisions which blood comes out from and ap applying that cup again or that horn again and what happens is the blood comes out of the small incisions that were made and this is hijama and it can be done on many places it's sometimes done on the head it's sometimes done on the forehead on the neck on the back uh, and indeed all over the body and those people who have expertise in it know that it has particular times and particular uh, rules and particular preferences of season and particular preferences of daytime and and other other sort of, sort of rules and regulations around hijama which are known by the people who specialize in it the question that we have to answer here is is there a proof that the Prophet ﷺ would make ghusl after having hijama done to him? Uh, there is another point on this uh, as well, which is that if we sort of look at hijama, often the person who does hijama will tell you don't take a bath for the next 24 hours. And so this hadith is mushkil because they're telling you don't take a bath for the next 24 hours and this hadith is telling you that the Prophet ﷺ used to make ghusl when he completed hijama. And then the next one we have is ghusl mayit which is washing the dead body. 
and again uh, uh, the washing of the dead body has again uh, some disagreement about it some of the scholars uh, said that it is a sunnah when washing a dead body and other opinions around it however we're going to give a very very simple conclusion to that, this hadith and that is that this hadith is ba'ifun jiddan it is extremely weak and therefore there is no authentic evidence from the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam to say that uh, this uh, or that there is that this is something the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam would do and therefore we don't say that there is any proven ghusl from hijama nor do we say that there is any proven ghusl from washing the dead body uh, and some of the scholars preferred making ghusl when washing the dead body but we say that even al-istihbab requires a dalil requires an evidence you can't just say something is recommended because you feel that it's a good thing to do you have to have an evidence for it and so based on this hadith are there other hadith this is a different question but based on this hadith there is no evidence for making ghusl after hijama nor is there any evidence for making ghusl after washing the dead body bearing in mind especially that that the people who perform hijama tell you not to make ghusl afterwards uh, and uh, this hadith is a weak hadith and therefore we say that there isn't anything in this hadith which would contradict that uh, uh, advice uh, this hadith is extremely weak because it contains uh, to the best of my knowledge Mus'ab ibn Shayba uh, and this is an extremely extremely weak hadith um, and uh, with regard to at least with regard to hijama there's no specific proof with regard to Ghassal Mayit as we said before some of the scholars considered this to be recommended uh, and some of them but there's certainly no evidence for it being uh, an obligation so now we move on to the issue of Jumu'ah in some detail. Uh, or before that, we move on to the issue of uh, a person becoming Muslim in hadith number 108. وعن أبي هريرة رضي الله عنه في قصة ثمامة ابن This is the hadith of Abu Huraira, and it has a long story in it. And this long story in it is the story of Thumama ibn Uthalin radiallahu ta'ala anhu arda, who was one of the, uh, or he was the Sayyid of Bani Hanifa from Al Yamama. He was one of the, the chiefs of Banu Hanifa which are the chief of the tribe, this tribe from Al-Yamama. Uh, and uh, he, he had uh, set out for Umrah when he was taken prisoner by the Muslims and taken to, uh, and taken to uh, Medina. And when he was taken uh, to Medina, he was uh, tied up in on one of the against one of the pillars in the masjid and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would go by him and every time he would go by him he would say Ma indaka ya Thumama what do you have to say O Thumama and Thumama would say the same three things every single time he would say something to the effect of and I'm going to roughly translate what he said something a lot to the effect of that if you show me leniency or if you are generous to me you will find me to be grateful and if you kill me you will kill someone who has many sins and i will be deserving whatever you do to me i will be deserving of it and if it is wealth that you want then take whatever you wish And again, the Prophet ﷺ would leave him and he was left for a number of days. When the Prophet ﷺ would pass by him, he would say, Ma indaka ya Thumama. What do you have to say, O Thumama? He would say, if you show me sort of generosity, then you're showing generosity to someone who will be grateful. And if you decide to take your revenge against me, 
then, or you decide to kill me, then you will do this to somebody who is deserving of it. They have sins. And if you, it is wealth that you want, then take whatever you wish. And the Prophet ﷺ left him for a, a, a number of time or a length of time until he said, Atliq Sumama, let Sumama go. So they untied Sumama. And in the authentic narration, Thumama went to one of the areas on the side and he made ghusl and he said, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah. I bear witness that, Muhammad, that Allah is the, there is no God worthy of worship except Allah and that Muhammad is the Messenger of Allah. Note in the authentic narration, Thumama made ghusl without speaking to the Prophet. Then after that, Thumama made Umrah as a Muslim and he said to the people of Makkah, O people of Makkah, there will not come to you even a single piece of, or a single seed of grain unless the Prophet ﷺ gives his permission. So he was responsible for a great deal of good that happened because the people of Makkah used to rely upon the grain that was coming from his people and his tribe. And he, after he became Muslim, he said, there will not come to you a single seed of grain until the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gives his permission. The key thing that we have to deal with in our chapter on ghusl is whether or not Thumama was commanded to make ghusl or whether or not Thumama made ghusl from his own uh, from his own, um, uh, you know, his own decision, or he made it out of his own choice. And we have to understand that in the authentic narrations of this story, like Al Hafid ibn Hajar said here, he said, when Thumama became Muslim, the messengers of the Prophet ﷺ commanded him to make ghusl. This was narrated by Abdul Razak al Sanani, the teacher of Imam Ahmad. And he said, the original story is muttafaqun alayh. The original story is present in Al-Bukhari and in Sahih Muslim. When we go back to Al-Bukhari and Muslim, we don't find the Prophet ﷺ commanding Thumama. We find Thumama out of his own initiative going to make ghusl. And so, Bearing in mind that this hadith has a weakness in it, it's not a strong hadith. Uh, the scholars differed over this issue and they had three different opinions. The first opinion is that it is obligatory for every new Muslim to make ghusl. And they based this upon this hadith of Thumama and upon other ahadith of various Sahaba making ghusl when they became Muslim. The second opinion is that it is not obligatory. Is that it is not obligatory. And they said all of the ahadith regarding this do not come out of being in one of two situations. Either they are weak or either they are about individuals from the companions. Afrad, any one person here, one person there. But is there any evidence that the companions en masse used to make ghusl when they became Muslim? Not a shred of evidence. One companion here, you know, three years later, one companion there. If the ahadith are authentic, then they are speaking about Sahaba acting on their own initiative. And there is not a single one of them that authentically proves the Prophet ﷺ ever commanded any of the Sahaba to make ghusl when they became Muslim. But they said it's permissible if he wants to make ghusl, he can make ghusl. If he wants to make ghusl, he can do so, but it's not a part of Islam that when you become a Muslim, you have to make ghusl. And the third opinion is that if he was previously junub, and in a state of janaba, or if the lady had previously had her menses, and she hadn't made ghusl before, then she needs to make ghusl before she becomes Muslim. What did the second group reply to that? 
They said the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu that Islam wipes out what came before it. How can you obligate somebody to make ghusl for something that came before their Islam, knowing that Islam wipes out everything that came before it? And they also mentioned the second problem, which is how do we teach a new Muslim to make ghusl or how do we make it clear that for them to become Muslim and pray, they have to make ghusl. It's very difficult. And you can tell one or two people if they come to an Islamic center, but how many people just become Muslim on their own? How many people become Muslim through a, 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 you know, something in a, a group or in a street or whatever, and they're not, they don't understand they have to make ghusl. How are we supposed to then get all of these people making, learning how to make ghusl and making ghusl the second that they become? Muslim, apart from, unless we tell them, just cover yourself from head to toe in water. But really, this is something that uh, I think personally that the, the second opinion is the strongest. Because first of all, Islam wipes out that, those things which came before it. Secondly, the majority of people who became Muslim from the Sahaba would have previously experienced Janaba or menstruation. Like most of them were adults when they became, most of them were adults, most of them were not small, small children. And so if they were adults, then that means they would have experienced the reason for ghusl. And yet there is not a single evidence that the Prophet ﷺ commanded even one of them to make ghusl. Therefore we say that it is not obligatory for the person who becomes Muslim to make ghusl. And even if they had a reason to make it, that reason is wiped out by their becoming Muslim because the Prophet ﷺ said, do you not know that Islam wipes out what came before it? And there's no harm in them making ghusl, or there's no harm in us saying it's allowed for them. And there's no harm in us saying to them that, you know, uh, it's nice if you go home, take a bath, prepare yourself for the prayer. But reaching that to the level of wujub or it being wajib, is definitely something which has, and we would say, fihi nadar. It has a criticism about it. It is open to criticism. We then come to two ahadith regarding the day of Jumu'ah. Our first hadith, hadith number 109, Abi Sa'id radiallahu an, anna Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam aqal, ghuslul Jumu'ati wajibun ala kulli muhtalim akhrajahu sabah. From Abu Sa'id radiallahu anh, that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, the ghusl of Jumu'ah, making ghusl on the day of Jumu'ah, is obligatory for every muhtalim. Muhtalim is from al-ihtilam. And al-ihtilam means to have a wet dream. So muhtalim is somebody who has a wet dream. However, the meaning of muhtalim here doesn't mean someone who has a wet dream on the day of Jumu'ah but it means someone who habitually has them, i.e. someone who reaches puberty. So the meaning of muhtalim here is somebody who has reached the age of having a wet dream and not a person, because some of the people may understand ghusl of the, on the day of Jumu'ah is wajib upon everyone who wakes up having had a wet dream, but we've understood that this is wajib anyway. It's wajib on Jumu'ah and it's wajib on Thursday and it's wajib on Wednesday and it's wajib on Sunday. So there is nothing special about Jumu'ah here. However, the meaning of muhtalim here, and this comes in the Quran as well, is that the word muhtalim is used for the one who reaches puberty. Balagh al-hulum, when they reach al-hulum, when they reach the age of having these kind of dreams, i.e. the age of puberty. I'll read you the second hadith so that we understand the mushkil because this hadith has a problem. And that is a hadith number 110. وَعَنْ سَمُرَةِ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُ أَنَّهُ قَالَ قَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ وَسَلَّمْ From Samura رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْ that he said, the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم said, whoever makes wudu, on the day of Jumu'ah, Fabiha wa Ni'mat. Fabiha wa Ni'mat is an Arabic expression 
which means that it is sufficient for them and what an excellent thing it is to do. Ni'mat is from the verb ni'mah uh, and uh, this means uh, for it to be, it's something praised, it's thana, it's to mean to praise something. So you say for example, ni'mar rajul, what an excellent man he is. And so, fabiha wa ni'mat, fabiha, yani biha, it is sufficient. It is sufficient for them. It's enough for them, or it's it's enough. It's sufficient for them to uh, to uh, suffice their obligation in terms of the say, state of Allah. Wa ni'mat, and what an excellent thing it is to do. Wa man iqtasal, and whoever performs ghusl, fal ghusl afdal. Ghusl is better and this is narrated by al khamsa the five yani the four sunan and musnad and al ah and imam ahmad in his musnad wa hasanahu tirmidhi and the tirmidhi said it is hadithun hasan so he here we have a little bit of a clash between two different ahadith our first hadith tells us that making ghusl on Jum'ah day is wajib for everyone who reached the age of puberty. And our second hadith, the hadith of Samura, tells us that the ghusl on the day of Jum'ah is better, but wudu is enough. So how do we understand this? First of all, let's just understand some of the background to the hadith. First of all, Ghusl al-Jumu'ah, the ghusl on the day of Jumu'ah, is, uh, is what we call in Arabic, Ibadat al-Musabbat in al sabbath It's where you effectively are calling it the ghusl of Jumu'ah, because Jumu'ah is the reason why you make the ghusl. It's not called the ghusl of Jumu'ah uh, for any other reason, except that Jumu'ah coming is the reason why you make it. So the reason it's called ghusl al-Jumu'ah, the ghusl on the day of Jumu'ah, is because Jumu'ah is the reason why you make the Ghusl at that time. The next thing that we have to cover is what does the word Wajib mean in the Arabic language? So what does it mean in the Arabic language and what does it mean in the Sulul So in the Arabic language, uh, Al-Wujub means a support. It means for something to fall down onto the ground or for something to fall down. Uh, that is what Al-Wujub means and from this uh, is the statement of Allah Azza wa Jal, فَإِذَا وَجَبَتْ جُنُوبُهَا If these animals fall down with their sides on the ground, وَجَبَتْ يعني it, when it falls down with its sides on the ground. So you slaughter the animal and then the animal falls over, or the animal, uh, the animal you know, sort of rests on the ground. This is the meaning of wajib in the Arabic language. And from this is al-wajbat, which is the sound of something when it falls, the sound of something crashing down or the sound of something falling down. However, al-wajib according to the scholars of Usul al-Fiqh is ma'in thabu fa'iru wa yu'abu ta'ibu the one, it is the, the action who, or the action which if you do it you are rewarded and if you leave it you are punished. So let's just remind ourselves of the different levels of, of, of action in Islam, the, the different types of, the different rulings, the different ahkam. First of all, we have wajib. And for now, we can consider wajib and fard to be the same thing. Broadly, according to the Jumu'ah, wajib and fard are the same thing. According to the Hanafis, there is a slight difference. Uh, and sometimes there is a difference for the rest in things like hajj and salah and stuff like that. But generally, fard and wajib mean the same thing for now. Let's just, for, to keep it simple, we'll keep fard and wajib to mean the same thing. So, fard and and wajib is if you do it, you get rewarded. And if you leave it, you get punished. Okay, what about mustahab? Something which is recommended. So that is ma yuthabu fa'iluhu wa la yu'aqaru ta'iluhu. It is the one that if you do it, you get rewarded. And if you don't do it, you don't get punished. If you leave it, you don't get punished. 
and then we have al makruh for now, we we'll come to al mubarak at the end. al makruh which is the opposite way around. ما يفاق تاركه ولا يعاقر فاعله The one who the one who leaves it is rewarded, and the one who does it isn't punished. And then you have the haram, which is the exact opposite of the wajib. ما يفاق تاركه ولا يعاقر فاعله The one who the one who does it gets punished, and the one who doesn't do it gets rewarded. And then the mubarak is the one that has neither any reward in it, nor does it have any punishment in it. It is simply permissible. So you have obligatory, recommended, permissible, disliked, and forbidden. Here we're talking about wajib. Here we're talking about wajib. And when you look at the hadith, the hadith doesn't seem like it's talking about something linguistic. You know, fell down on the floor or lie down on the floor. It doesn't seem like to be anything like that. The hadith is quite clearly speaking about al wujub a sharai. Therefore, it's, it's indicating to us when we first read the hadith, uh, hadith number 109, when we first read this hadith, the hadith of Abu Sa'id, it indicates to us that it's an obligation to make ghusr yawm jumu'ah. So, as you can imagine, the scholars of Islam differed over this in three different opinions. I, I'm always amazed when this happens because whenever you think that, you know, you hear two hadith with two different opinions and you hear three opinions from the scholars, you always think, where did the third one come from? Because obviously there is an opinion you have to make also. And obviously there's an opinion you don't have to make also. But what is the third opinion? So in any case, the first opinion is wajib. Any guesses for who held this opinion from the Malay? Is it easy? That's an easy one. Allah oh. Because they took the apparent wording of the hadith and they did not take the meaning or the wording of the hadith of Samura. So they took the, the hadith in the apparent way. Generally, in Allah, we are well known that they don't tend to be very nuanced and very, you know, sort of choosing and finding balances. It tends to be of what the hadith says, that's what it is. So the Bahiriya, they held the opinion of the hadith of Abu that the Ghusl on the Jumu'ah is wajib on every single person, every single Jumu'ah. And the majority of the scholars from the former life, but others, they said that it is mustahab, it is recommended. And the evidence for that was the hadith of Samurai. What did they then say about the hadith of Abu Sa'id? They said that wajib here means sunnah mu'akkada. So wajib here means wajib, and here's where we get a little complicated as the Hanafis understand wajib. So this is not usually how the Jumu'ah understand wajib, but the Hanafis have a slight distinction, and I'm going to really simplify this because it's always going to be your own mind. But the Hanafis have a simple distinction that fard is what you must do according to the definition just give of wajib. And wajib is sunnah mu'akkada that's so similar to fard you almost can't tell the difference, but it's not quite. Sunnah Muhammad is a highly recommended Sunnah. And so they said that this is the meaning of wajib in this hadith. The meaning of wajib is not that you, you are sinful if you leave it, but that it is extremely recommended for you to do, like the winter and like the uh, Sunnah before Fajr and so on and so forth, that if you you know you leave it every week, you're blamed. You, you deserve to be blamed, but you're not sinful. So the one who never prays with her, it's not sinful, they don't get any sin, but they are a person who has a is should be blamed, I and mean, they should have a it should be said to them that how can you know the Prophet prayed with her every single night, whether he was healthy or sick, whether he was traveling or resident, and then you don't pray. It's blameworthy in your character and your iman, but it's not sinful. And so that's what they said is the meaning of wajib in the hadith of Abi Sa'id. The third opinion, and this is where it gets interesting, and this is the opinion of Shaykh Islam and Mutaymi and Ibn Qayyim, rahimahullah ta'ala, is a differentiation between the two ahad. And they said that whoever has an unpleasant smell, or whoever has, uh, 
you know, clothes that have, they have been sweating in, or they have been smelled, you know, there's a smell coming from them. Then ghusl on the day of Jumu'ah is wajib. Why? Because if they don't make ghusl on the day of Jumu'ah, it's not like a regular prayer. I mean, with a regular prayer, you have to come to the prayer without a bad smell. The Prophet Sallallahu mentioned about eating garlic. The one that eats garlic, don't come to our, don't come to our, our jama'ah. Don't attend our gathering if you've been eating garlic. Then how about the person who all week has been working in the sun? And remember the Sahaba were very poor. They only had, many of them only had one single piece of clothing. Some of them did not even have two pieces to cover the bottom half and the top. They just had one piece to wrap around their, their body top and bottom. And you imagine they are working all week. And for sure there will be a need to make ghusl. And so they said the hadith of Abu Sa'id refers to the one who needs to make ghusl. Uh, and uh, uh, that the hadith of uh, Semurah refers to everybody else. I mean, it's recommended for everybody, but if you have a bad smell or if there's some other reason, then for sure you need to make Muslim in that case. Because on Jumu'ah, it's not the same as a regular prayer, the masjid is packed out, and so that smell will become very strong and people don't shower. Because the, the smell will not be like in a regular masjid where it will be, you know, dissipated. Most people smell fine and one or two people have a bad smell. It doesn't matter so much. But if you have a room of you know, 500 people packed into a very small space with a very bad smell coming from many of them, then this will stop the people from being able to focus on the Jumu'ah and on the prayer. Wallahi, Sheikh Hussain Hafidullah Ta'ala, he prefers the opinion of Sheikh Hussain Mutaymi. I must admit that I, while I think that opinion is absolutely valid in terms of practicality, I'm not sure that that is the best explanation of the, the Jumu'ah. I personally think that the second explanation is better. That the, the word wajib in the hadith is referring to sunnah mu'akkada. However, there's no doubt that in terms of action, the opinion of Shaykh al-Islam is what we do. Because there's no doubt that if you, whether this hadith indicates it or not, I don't think there's any disagreement that if you have a bad smell, you have to remove that bad smell before you come to the masjid. And that is proven by the hadith of garlic uh, and more onion and so on and so forth. And there's no, I don't think there is any disagreement on that topic. So I agree with the opinion of Shaykh al-Islam and the Allah Ta'ala. I'm just not sure whether this particular hadith is a proof for it. The opinion, no doubt about it, but I'm just not sure whether this particular hadith is really the intention of the hadith of Abu Sa'id. And my evidence for that, whether it's wrong or right, my evidence for that is the statement of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, for every single person who reaches the age of puberty. And every single person who reaches the age of puberty doesn't really indicate to me, at least, that this is referring to a small group of people who happen to have a bad smell. Uh, I think that the opinion is valid, completely valid, and the opinion, like we say, al amal al-Ali, we act upon this opinion. Like, this is what we do. If you have a bad smell, you have it's wajib for you to make also your mutuah. But I'm just not sure that this hadith is mentioned in that context, uh, and Allah Azza wa Jalla knows best. There are some issues we have to deal with on the topic of the Usul of Jumu'ah, which we may as well deal with now. From them are the issue of when we make the Usul on the day of Jumu'ah. These ahadith don't specify a time. So the ahadith don't say it has to be in the morning, or it has to be after Jumu'ah or before Jumu'ah, or that it has to be, what about if it's on the Thursday night, because of course Jumu'ah begins at Maghrib, on the night before and finishes the public on the, the on the Friday. So do we have flexibility to make it whenever we want? Uh, there is some evidence that the best time, and some of the scholars said the right time to make also on the day of Jumu'ah is immediately before leaving, immediately before leaving the house to go to the masjid. And uh, there is a number of, of uh, reasons for this. One of them is the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Whoever is on their way to Jumu'ah and setting out to Jumu'ah, that can be also. And uh, there is also uh, a number of other hadith. Uh, and the fact is that we 
when we look at it, this is the time when it's the most beneficial. However, many other scholars said any time after sunrise. And some of them said after Fajr. So there's a wide sort of range of opinions in there. But the best time at the time when it is the most beneficial to make that also is to make that also uh, before or just before you go out to the Jumu'ah. So to make it one of the last things you do before going out to the Jumu'ah. But if you were to make it any time in the morning after sunrise, then this is also acceptable. Uh, there is another uh, issue as well on that. And that is that for those who are married, it is recommended for that also to be a husl from Janabah. So it is recommended for a man to be intimate with his wife on the day of Jumu'ah before making that husl. And that is based on a number of evidence is from the Mahalif and Ghassala wa Tasal. And some of the scholars said the word Ghassala means to make someone else make husl. That he whoever causes his wife to make husl and makes husl. And he comes early and he strives in that in that coming early. He gets out of the house early and he comes to the house early. And he goes near to the Imam and listens carefully to him. And the, the hadith has a number of, uh, of rewards for doing so uh, in terms of forgiveness and so on and so forth. So it's, uh, there is a, an evidence that that also is recommended to be a Muslim from Janabah. And Ibn Qayyim mentions a reason for this. Ibn Qayyim he said that the reason for this is that, that Jumu'ah is a day when everybody goes out. Okay, it's a day when women go out because it's, a woman can, is allowed to attend the Jumu'ah prayer in the masjid. And it's a day when if you're going to see something you shouldn't, it, might, it may well be on the day of Jumu'ah. And that still applies to us today. That still applies to us today. That when is the day when you have the most problem with lowering your gaze? It's the day of Jumu'ah. You know, the night of Jumu'ah, or the day of Jumu'ah, or the night of, you know, the day of the the Friday night before the Saturday or Thursday night. And this is the time when people go out. Uh, and so, you uh, sort of taking advantage of the, the rights of the, the husband uh, or the rights of the spouse in that regard is definitely better for you to be able to lower your gaze and better for you to be able to uh, to go to the Jumu'ah prayer and to come back from the Jumu'ah prayer without having uh, seen anything inappropriate or without being, having, having been affected by that. That leads on to another topic, which is the issue of women and whether women are required to make also on the day of Jumu'ah. The apparent wording of the, of the first hadith indicates that it's not required for a woman to make husl, and that's because muhtali only applies to a man. It doesn't, we don't usually use the word muhtali for a woman. And therefore, uh, the, 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 the husl of Jumu'ah is wajib on, on every muhtali, and every male who reaches the age of puberty. However, there are a couple of side points to that. Uh, the first one is that if the sister comes to the Jumu'ah prayer, then the same reasons for her making, for the man making Muslim apply to her. So we would say that it is recommended for the woman who goes to the Jumu'ah prayer to make Muslim. Secondly, this hadith Man Ghassala also indicates that it is recommended for the woman to make Muslim on the day of Jumu'ah. Shirk was not having a wala. He restricted himself and said it's not recommended except if she goes to the masjid. But this hadith of Ghassala indicates that it is recommended for a woman to make Musa Yawm Jumu'ah and Allah Azza wa Jalla knows best because the hadith says whoever makes Musa or whoever causes his wife to make Musa and he makes Musa. And there's an ikhtilaf I know among this hadith the scholars do not all agree about the meaning of Ghassala and Ghassiru. Some of them said that it means to make also really thoroughly, and some of them say it means to make your wife make also. Uh, and uh, from those who said that it means to make your wife make also, Ibn Qayyim, Rahimullah, and others, and I think that this 
if we take it in that way, indicates that it is there is still some evidence for recommendation for women. But there's no doubt that the women made in Ghusl on the day of Jumar is not the same as the men. It's not the same level of Sunnah uh, and And the evidence for it being extremely important only applies to the men. As for the women, then it is something that they can do. And if they go out to the masjid, then we can say that it's better for them to make Ghusl because the same benefits will be gained of the fact that the people who want the bad smell and the people who will be able to, uh, to benefit from the, uh, the Jumu'ah. Another issue that we have to deal with as well, inshaAllah, is the issue of the virtue of the day of Jumu'ah. So the Prophet وسلم, said that the sun did not rise nor did it set on a day better than the day of Jumu'ah. The sun did not rise nor did it set on a day better than the day of Jumu'ah. On that day, Adam was created, and on that day, Adam entered Jannah, and on that day, Adam was expelled from Jannah, and the day of judgment will happen on the day of Jumu'ah, and the, the hour when all of your du'a is, or the time when all of your du'a is accepted, also takes place on the day of Jumu'ah. And as you know, there are some different opinions regarding the scholars on when that time is, and the strongest of them is that it is just before Maghrib on the day of Jumu'ah. And some of them said it is when the Imam uh, sits down on the mimbar before he stands up. But I think the stronger opinion is the, the sa'ah, the istijada, on the day of Jumu'ah, the hour where your where you du'a is accepted, is the, ta- is the one that is just before Salat al-Maghrib. Just before Salat al-Maghrib, that is the time when your du'a is accepted. So there are a number, and in Zad al-Ma'arif, Ibn Qayyim Ta'ala mentions more than 40 virtues of the day of Jumu'ah. He mentions a huge number of virtues of the, of the day of Jumu'ah. So some of the benefits we took from this, uh, we took from it uh, the benefit of uh, making ghusl on the day of Jumu'ah, and uh, likewise we took from it the benefit uh, that making ghusl or, or it being highly recommended is something that is specifically for men, but that women can be attached to that with certain conditions. And we also uh, learned that it is required for us at all times to keep good bodily hygiene. And that means not to smell, not to uh, have a bad body odor or a bad odor coming from their mouth and so on and so forth. And that, that is something that is required from them specifically for the five daily prayers and Jumu'ah uh, and based on the hadith in Allah Jameel and Jamal Allah is beautiful and He loves beauty We now come to our next hadith Bear in mind we've got a lot of hadith to get through because we have a set number of uh, pages to get through uh, each day so that we can finish in time inshallah وعن علي رضي الله عنه أنه قال كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يقرأ القرآن ما لم يكن جنبا رواه أحمد الخمسة وهذا رفض التلميذ وحسنه وصححه من حسن ثم علي رضي الله عنه he said the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم used to recite the Quran to us you pray for them he used to recite the Quran and he used to teach the Quran both of them come under Yuqari'una He used to recite the Qur'an to us and he used to teach the Qur'an to us as long as he was not Junub as long as he was not Junub This is narrated by Imam Ahmad and it should say here it says here Rawah wa Ahmad wa Khamsa but this is a mistake from probably one of the people who transcribed the book and the correct wording we should be Rawah wa Ahmad wa Arba why? Because Ahmed is one of the Khamsa. So like it's like seeing Ahmed narrated it and Ahmed narrated it. But it should be Rawah wa Ahmed wa Arba. And that is found in some of the some of the scripts, some of the manuscripts of the Quran have got written in it. Rawah wa Ahmed wa Arba. Ahmed and the four Sunan narrated it. Uh, otherwise you could take Ahmed out and say Rawah wa Khamsa. It was narrated by the five, the four Sunan and Hence the, the wording of Timidi and he declared it to be fair and it was declared authentic by Ibn Ibn uh, Ta'ala. This 
hadith deals with the issue of whether or not, or begins to deal with the issue of the things which are forbidden for the person in the state of Janaba to do. So we mentioned that there are certain things that are forbidden for the person in the state of Janaba to do. One of them is what is mentioned in the ayah, Allah said, Oh, you who believe, do not come near to the prayer while you are drunk until you know what it is that you're saying. Nor while you are in a state of janab, i.e., do not come to the masjid while you're in a state of janab, unless you are just go passing through. So you can come to the masjid and just you know, walk into the masjid and walk out of it, but don't remain in the masjid for a long time when you are junum. Hatta taftasi, until you make ghusl. The issue mentioned in this hadith is, is it permissible for the person in the state of Janaba to recite the Qur'an? Some of the hadith get to the point where the Prophet Sallallahu said, Fala wa not even a single ayah. There are, of course, there's the issue of judging the Mus'haf, and there is you know, a long, long, long uh, discussion on this. Uh, and the argument is quite, it's quite a heated argument that usually comes on this issue, whether or not the person who is journal can uh, recite the Quran. Because we know, we've come across the hadith, the Prophet used to remember Allah in every circumstance, and in every situation, whether he was journal, whether he was uh, whether he had been also, whether he was in Wudu, whether he was out of Wudu, he would remember Allah in every single circumstance. So this uh, hadith comes into this particular uh, topic or this particular uh, issue. And I certainly think that what is befitting and what is the, what is the safer opinion is that the Juno should not recite the Quran. And the issue is very detailed, it's probably more detailed than we have time to go into. Uh, if you want to read the other opinion, then uh, in English, I believe, if you have a look at, uh, there is a translation of Sheikh al-Bani, uh, argument for the fact that the journal can recite the Quran and can judge the Mus'ha. Uh, Sheikh Hamid al Jibari mentioned this in uh, one of his books. Uh, he has on one of the rulings of uh, purification, you know, something like that. It might be his book of immenses, it might be another book, uh, in which he summarizes the English for the opinion of Shia Al-Bani with regard to uh, the permissibility of reciting the Quran. And you can see the hadith, and you can see the different sides of it. But the reality of the situation is, first of all, it's an opinion of the majority. And we don't always go with the majority, but it has a hadith about it. And secondly, it's not difficult to follow. Because we keep coming back to the fact that when it comes to Janara, you getting pure is in your own hands. There's no nothing to stop you taking a shower and then reading the Quran. So really there's no it's not like the one who is menstruating, the lady who's menstruating. She can't be out there. She can't be also and be able to just you know, change to what she likes. But the one in the state of Janara, realistically there is no real need for that person to recite the Quran in the state of Janara. Realistically it's very, very easy for them to just make also and then the issue is over and over. Uh, and you know, definitely the overwhelming majority of the scholars have the opinion that the person in the state of Janaba cannot recite the Quran. And yes, there are some weakness in some of the hadith, but if, when you put all the hadith together, it does give you a feeling of, of a certain amount of uh, a certain amount of strength uh, to it. And bear in mind that this doesn't include the Quran. Thank you.
start citing the picture form and you start citing the bar, and there's no need to because it may be also is something that you are easily able to do. And so I personally think that it's better to be safe in this and it's better not to go and take an opinion that is quite a you know, small minority opinion and then to follow that opinion uh, to you bear it in mind that it's not very difficult to make also. So I think that this is something that we can be a little bit, a little bit stricter on. The hadith contains a number of benefits from it. It's the virtue of the Sahara or the Quran because the Prophet was to teach them the Quran. And they were the students of the Prophet They are the ones the Prophet used to recite the Quran to. They are the ones the Prophet used to teach, and used to educate, and used to give them the tafsir of the Quran. So their virtue is in there. Uh, and uh, this also contains the permissibility of reciting the Quran without wudu. Because the hadith mentions Janada and it says that all other times the Prophet will recite the Quran. Therefore, that indicates to us that it is permissible to recite the Quran without wudu. As for teaching the Mus'haf, I also say the same opinion about teaching the Mus'haf, that it's better to be safe, because there is no real need for you to touch the Mus'haf without wudu. And so it's better, in my opinion, for to be safe, bearing in mind again that it is the majority opinion. But if you want to read the other side to that again in the same book, um, you can read uh, the translation of the Shaykh al Allah, his opinion regarding it, uh, and you can get a perspective of the other side of the argument. But as I said, I think that the safer things in this issue, it's no big deal, it's easy for you to follow, is don't touch the Mus'haf without the law, and don't read the Quran while you're in the state of Geneva. <coughs> we now come to the next hadith, which is hadith number 112. وعن أبي سعيد الخدري رضي الله عنه أنه قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم إذا أتى أحدكم أهلا ثم أراد أن يعود فليتوضأ بينهما وضوءا رواه مسلم وزاد الحاكم فإنه أنشط للعود. ثم حديث أبو سعيد الخدري رضي الله عنه أن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قال إذا كان يقول لأحدكم أهلا أي أي أحدكم أهلا then he wants to go to her again. And he wants to uh, be intimate with her again after having been intimate with her the first time. Let him make a wudu in between. And this is permitted by Muslim and al Hakim added, for it will be better and sharp. And sharp, and he will have more energy to go back. And sharp, he will have more energy to be able to go back. Uh, this is from the etiquette of the person who is a Juno. So a person may ask the question, if a person is in a state of Janada and then they wish to be intimate with their wife again, do they then need to make also in between or not? So the author wants to clarify to us that they do not need to make also in between, but that the sunnah is to make wudu in between, and that this will be better for them and it will be better for them uh, in terms of their energy and their activity. We'll come to our next hadith, which is hadith number 113, where it all about an Aisha radiallahu anha and her qalat, can Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yanamu wa huwa junubu min ghayri an yamassama wa huwa ma'adu. The hadith of Aisha radiallahu anha, that she said, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to go to sleep when he was in a state of janana without touching any water. Without touching any water. This is al-hadith al-hajasat wa ma'akulim. It is a weak hadith. This hadith actually is, is really interesting. And I don't, I don't usually give you a lot of the signs of hadith when I'm teaching this class. But this hadith has something really worthwhile. And that is that a number of the scholars of, of, of later times from the Fuqaha and from the Muhaddithu declared this hadith to be authentic. And I want you to listen what Al Hafid Ibn Abd al Hadi Ta'ala said about this hadith and what Ibn Rajab said about this hadith. Because the statement of those two is absolutely, uh, what's the word? It's absolutely, you know. 
very, very strong against the people who said this hadith to be authentic. So, we'll give you the statement first of all of uh, the statement of uh, Ibn Abdul Hadi in Al Muharram. He's quoting from one of the Salaf, one of the early uh, Imams, one of the scholars. Uh, sorry, he's quoting from one of the late Imams, who's quoting from one of the early Imams. And this Imam he says, he said, there is consensus from the early and the later scholars of hadith that this hadith is an error since the time of Abu Ishaq until today. And his, his students took it from him in this way and carried it on from him in this way. And he made the error and his students continued passing the error on, on in this way. And it is the first or the second hadith mentioned by Imam Muslim in his book at Tamiz from the ahadith which were carried in the wrong way, i.e. they were transmitted in error. Ibn Rajab is even stricter than that. And Ibn Rajab has a huge sort of lengthy speech in which he criticizes the people who declare this hadith to be authentic. Uh, Ibn Rajab says, وهذا الحديث مما اتفق علمة الحديث من السلف على إنكار. This hadith is from those things which the imams of hadith from the early generations are agreed upon that it is to be rejected from Abi Ishaq. منهم إسماعيل بن خالد وشعب ويزيد بن حاوي وأحمد بن حنبل وأبو بكر بن أبي شيبة ومسلم بن حجاج وأبو بكر الأثرم. والجوزجاني والترمذي والدار القطني وحاكى ابن عبد البر عن سفيان الثوري انه قال هو خطا. So he mentions this long list of great scholars of hadith from them Shu'ba ibn Hajjaj al Wasti, from them Ahmad ibn Hanbal, Abu Bakr ibn Abi Shayba, Ismail ibn Khalid, Al Imam Muslim, Al Jawzajani, Al Tirmidhi, Al Dar al Qutani, all of them agree unanimously that this hadith is an error. That this hadith is an error. Then he said, وقال أحمد بن صالح بن سليم الحافظ لا يحل ولا يحل أن يروى هذا أو لا يحل أن يروى هذا الحديث يعني أن المخاطب المقطوع به فلا تحل روايته من دون بيان من دون بيان علته. He said, this hadith is not permissible for you to narrate to anyone without explaining the error that is in it. And Muhammad ibn Rajab continues. He says, وَأَمَّا الْفُقَعَاءُ الْمُتَأَخِّرُونَ فَكَثِيرٌ مِّنْهُمْ نَظَرَ إِلَى فِقَةِ رِجَالِهِ فَوَرْنَ صِحَةٍ وَهَاهُ لَا يَظُنُّونَ أَنَّ كُلَّ حَدِيثٍ رَوَاهُ صِغَى فَرْوَى حَدِيثٍ صَحِيحٍ وَلَا يَتَفَطَّنُونَ تِقَائِقِ الْعِلْمِ أو عِلْمِ ووفقهم طائفة من المحدثين المتأخرين كالطحاوي والحاكم والبيهقي. So we continue with this uh, explanation of Al-Hadr ibn Rajab. Al-Hadr ibn Rajab mentions something very important. He says, some of the later fuqaha, yani this is something that all of these great scholars unanimously read on. Then along later on came some of the scholars of Fiqh who had no knowledge of hadith and no knowledge of the people of hadith and they looked at this hadith and said Fiqa, 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 Fiqa Sahih This hadith is Sahih And he said So many of them looked at the reliability of the men of the chain so they thought that it was correct And these people think that every hadith that is narrated by a reliable narrator is an authentic hadith And he's criticizing them saying that these people, they think that just because the narrators are reliable, that the hadith is sahih. He says, and they do not, or they are not aware of the minute details of ilal hadith, of the ilal, 
the, the, the detailed reasons why a hadith is authentic or not authentic. And he said, and a group of the later scholars of hadith agree with them, like the Tahawi and al Hakim and al Bayhaqi. And this is in fact Hadari by Ibn Rajab Rahimullah Ta'ala. From the also Shaykh al Adani Rahimullah Ta'ala declared the hadith to be Hassan. But the point that we make here is a couple of benefits. First of all, we realize that the science of hadith Kwami, is not a matter of just checking up some names in Taqrib or Taqrib or Taqrib or Taqrib or something like that or Taqrib or Kalam and then just having a look at some names and saying, okay, he's reliable, he's reliable, he's reliable, yeah, this hadith is reliable. This hadith was a mistake made by an imam of hadith who never made mistakes. This is the problem. Abu Sahab, he didn't make mistakes and he's thick up, he's a reliable narrator. And his sheikh was thikha, and his sheikh was thikha, and all of the people in the chain are alive. Yet unanimously, these great scholars of hadith from them, Shu'ba, Imam al muhaddithi Shu'ba ibn Hajjaj al Wasiti, and from them, Imam Muslim, from them, Ahmad ibn Hanbal, unanimously come together to say this hadith was an error from Abu Ishaq. He made a mistake in it, and it is hadith from Barak. It was an error from the beginning. The first time that it was narrated, it was by Abu Ishaq, it was an error. And all of his students took the error on from him and carried the error on. And so we see that there is no evidence that the Prophet وسلم, went to sleep without having made wudu. Rather, his sunnah would that he would be that he would either make wudu, he would either make istinja and wudu, or he would make wudu, one or the other. Having said that, don't let it take you away from the fifth of the hadith, which is that it is perfectly permissible for you to go to sleep without making wudu or without making ghusl. There is no requirement, that it's no, it's not wajib for you to make ghusl uh, if you're in Janata before you go to sleep, nor is it wajib for you to make wudu before you go to sleep. However, if you talk about the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu then the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu is to make either wudu or ghusl. So we have three levels of preference. The lowest level of preference is for you to go to sleep without in Janata, without ghusl and without wudu. Uh, so to go to sleep without ghusl and without wudu. The second level is this sort of medium level is to go to sleep with wudu or without wudu. And that wudu is not the same wudu that you pray with. It's not the wudu of prayer. It's the same wudu you make, but it's there what we call takhfiful janaba. It's there to lighten the, the impurity of the janaba. It doesn't take it away. You're still true. You still can't recite the Quran. You still can't touch the Mus'haf. But it lightens your the, you know, the, the impurity makes it, you know, at least you have washed your areas of wudu before you went to sleep. And the third and the best of the best in it also. So a person has a choice of to go, go to sleep without being a Muslim, or, uh, or go, go to sleep by being a Muslim without being a Muslim, or take a Muslim and then go to sleep. All three of them are permissible. But as for the Sunnah of the Prophet, that which is narrated is only either wudu or ghusl, and it's never narrated that he went to sleep without touching any.